Hello, hello. Welcome back. Another live stream. Uh, this is all about the core Dungeons and Dragons 5e rules, where I discuss and uh, show um, you how they work. Now, I'm going to say right now, um, things didn't quite work out the way I was expecting. <laughs> And, and I'm going to apologize if you don't wind up getting the experience you were expecting today from this particular live stream. But I realized once I had scheduled it, and then I looked at all my preparation for this, that I had made a mistake. Okay. And so I had a choice in that since my slides were not ready and my material was not ready, I could cancel, even though I had scheduled this live stream. Then I realized I'm playing a wizard, so I actually do know quite a bit about magic, and so therefore I can probably do this, um, maybe not quite the way I would like with all of the graphics that I was had planned, <laughs> but aren't finished, but uh, I can still do this. Um, so I'm going to apologize now if this is not the experience you were looking for, I can assure you in the future it will be significantly better. But certainly consider this an opportunity to ask me lots of questions and give me lots of feedback. And I will certainly improve the experience for the future. So if you do have questions, that's why the poll is there, then ask them. Otherwise, um, grab some food, some drink, get comfortable. I'm going to be keeping an eye on my chat uh, as I go, just for the sake of, well, the fact is I'm probably going to answer your questions as I go, rather than just like, uh I'll do that at the end. Um, in this case, I'm going to be a little bit different about things. Okay, so um, I have my chat open. It is working. And so I can keep an eye on what's going on. How's it going, Seeker? Hello. How's it going, Lauren? I'm glad you can make it. How's it going, big kid? Uh, <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get into what I do actually have. <laughs> and um, yes, like I said, I apologize for the uh, experience not being what I had hoped for. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons because I always do talk about Dungeons and Dragons. One of my favourite topics is definitely magic and this is the Dungeons and Dragons 5e rules or core rules lesson. This is supposed to be lesson plan for magic mechanics and at this point I would normally show you a slideshow. But as I have been saying, I don't have a slideshow I discovered. And in fact, I have incomplete notes, which is not helpful for a situation like this. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to use uh, a different solution to my problem, which is I'm going to use D&D Beyond. OK, we're going to work through the, the basics of magic. <clears throat> I think that was the only way I could see of solving my problem here since I didn't really get everything finished. So I'm going to work off uh, D&D Beyond uh, for today. And <clears throat> feel free to ask questions as you, as you go, but uh, essentially my plan here is to go over the, the absolute basics in terms of how magic works. Now I've pulled this directly from the player's handbook. Um, but what I want to do, rather than going through D&D Beyond straight away, I just want to show you I do actually have something prepared, okay? What I want to do is I, I want to sort of just go over some of the basics, answer your questions as I go, and then I'll come back to this screen. So I'm just showing you I do have something prepared. For those of you who are like, mm, what's going on here, Fred? Don't worry. It's all under control. All right. So back to my face because I feel like that's going to be a bit easier for me to manage with uh, what I have planned, because I do actually have some notes, as it happens, just incomplete. Uh, yes, Seeker, uh, possible topic of, uh, of confusion, focus, component um, pouches. Yes, look, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that sort of stuff anyway. So let me just go through that process and discuss those things, because um, I absolutely understand that there can be some confusion around them. So we're definitely going to go to there. Go there. Right, so first off, magic in a fantasy world, particularly Dungeons and Dragons, works a particular way, and it's very different to other roleplay systems. So you have things called a spell level. This indicates how powerful magic is that you're, being, you're creating or um, is being cast. It also um, indicates how difficult, and it's not just how powerful, but how difficult is that spell to cast. And the levels go from 
zero level, which is fairly easy. These are basic rudimentary spells called cantrips. Um, and then you've got level one right through to level nine. There used to be, in fact, level 10 spells, but they have been removed from the game as a result of some uh, problems that occurred in Dungeons and Dragons lore. Uh, so some of you may be aware of the Living Gate and uh, the, the problem that occurred around that with regard to 10th level spells, but they, they used to be, but there aren't any more. They don't exist. Okay, so <clears throat> character level doesn't actually co correspond to your spell level. So if you're a level 1, um, that doesn't just mean that, okay, you can just cast level 1 spells. Although at level 1, you in most, most classes, uh, if they're a full caster, can cast a um, cantrip, cantrips and a level one spell, but not all um, character levels indicate that you can cast a, a first level spell. So your character level does not indicate whether you can cast a particular spell of a particular level. That's one of the things that most people get confused. Cantrips are zero level spells, so the good thing about these is you can use them an infinite number of times uh, without using up any spell slots. Spell slots are usually allocated, well they are in fact, allocated to spells of level 1 through to 9, but you can cast a cantrip or a zero level spell as many times as you like. So you can spam that sucker till you go blue. And <clears throat> uh, the other nice thing about um, uh, a cantrip is you, you don't have to prepare them. Like you, you know a certain number of them and you can use those as many times as you like. So that's kind of nice. Uh, I always recommend that people be very careful about their cantrip selection because you're going to use those potentially from uh, level 1 right through to level 20. So try to pick things that you're going to still find useful later on. <clears throat> um, casting time. So this is how long it takes you to cast a spell. Uh, and... It's like creating the spell. Um, they're broken up into a couple of different categories. You have spells that take a, a bonus action to cast. So they, they can be performed very quickly on your turn. So a bonus action spell. There's a an action spell. So these are using your main action, which is not the same thing as a bonus action. Uh, you'll also find there's another one called a reaction spell. These are cast as a reaction on somebody else's turn normally or in response to a trigger. Say, for example, the shield spell, if somebody hits you, you can try to activate your shield spell and deflect the attack. And then there are uh, casting times that are longer than an action, a bonus action, or a reaction. Those are quite quick. Uh, and they can be up to a, a minute or longer. There's lots of spells that are quite high level that do that sort of thing. If you're casting a ritual, it would take um, 10 minutes plus the um, the spell level. So it's it's uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of different casting times involved. One of the things that you probably need to remember when you're casting your spells is you can only have one reaction um, spell uh, in any round. Not on your turn, but any round. A round designates everybody's turn within, you know, it's the first round, everybody takes a turn. So you can only use one reaction spell on a turn. On a round and then uh, you only get one bonus action spell so as a result you need to be careful about when you use it because well you, you can't stack more than one okay even if you would like to do so okay you can't swap out a bonus action spell and go with another bonus action spell and then not use your action it doesn't work like that so you get one bonus action spell now if you cast a bonus action spell that means your main action that you would normally do something with to cast another spell that has to be a cantrip. So be very careful when you're designating what spells you're going to cast. If you decide to cast Fireball, and then you decide, ah, I'd also like to cast Misty Step to get out of trouble. And Misty Step say, bonus action spell? Well, there's a problem. You've already cast a spell that's level 3. Okay? And if you've already done the damage on your enemies, that just causes a whole lot of hassles for your Dungeon Master and everybody else at the table. So my advice to you is, if you're going to cast a bonus action spell, make sure you designate that you're going to do that first, so that when you follow up to have your main action, you you, you don't want to run into the problem of selecting a spell that has a, a level to it, and you're only p um, picking a, a zero level spell or a cantrip. Uh, okay, uh, components to a spell. 
there are components to any spell. These are sort of like the physical requirements of uh, spell casting or spell spell formation, and you you must meet these in some sort of order to cast the spell. So usually uh, you'll have a variety. There's usually up about three different things that can be classified as a component to a spell. Not all spells have all of the requirements, so not every single spell you ever come across will have three components to them, but a lot of them do have these. Uh, there is the verbal component. This is when you are speaking, you chant a mystical word to form the spell in some way. Uh, and of course, if you want to do this without somebody noticing that you're casting a spell, you need to make sure you don't need to use a verbal component, or you're going to need to use something like subtle spell to actually eliminate the need to actually speak the spell out. You're doing it in your head instead. Uh, somatic. This is the spell ca casting gestures uh, to manip you know, manipulate, manipulating the world and the energy around you to form magic and put it, in, bring it into existence. And it usually requires, and almost always, at least one free hand to perform it. So if you're wielding a sword or you're carrying a ranged weapon and you have a shield as well that's going to be a problem. Okay, you need to make sure one of those hands are free to cast your magic. And even if you're not having a hand free to cast your magic, you need to have at least one hand free if you're going to be holding a spell focus, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, materials are the, the parts of a spell that um, you might have a component pouch, you might be dealing with herbs and spices and animal poo and all sorts of interesting things, um, rats, guts, so forth. Uh, these are the bits and pieces. This is the material that you use in your hand as you're making the gesture to, to actually create that magic. And you can actually eliminate the need for that part of the spell provided it doesn't have a monetary um, uh, value listed beside it. So if it does, if it just lists the, these are these items that you need to cast the spell, you need a bit of ink and a feather or something like that, uh, that's fine. But if it says you need to have a pearl worth 100 gold pieces, then you need to have the pearl worth 100 gold pieces. Okay, You can't get around that particular material co um, component uh, by having a spell focus. Now, a spell focus is normally anywhere, if anything could be a wand, it can be a rod, it can be a crystal, a, uh, uh, an orb, uh, it can be a staff. There's lots of different things you can use as a spell casting focus. I know a lot of people like the idea of having a book as their spell casting focus, okay? So lots of different things there. So when you're using either your spell casting focus or ma the materials for forming that magic, you're binding the magic to the physical world in some way by using those materials. Again, you need to have a hand free. You only need to have one hand free to perform the gesture and to manipulate the materials. So it doesn't mean you need to have a hand free to do the gesturing and another hand free to hold all the ingredients in your hand. So you don't have to have two hands free, okay? The material component and the somatic or gesture can all be performed in the same hand. <laughs> right, so let's move on to, I guess, the duration of a spell. Durations of spells can vary. They can be instantaneous. They just have an effect and then they, that's it. Uh, they might last for uh, just the end of, until the end of your turn. They might last for a whole round. They might last for uh, up to a minute. They might last for eight hours or 24 hours. They can last quite a long time. So I, I can't give you every single different duration because there is a lot of variation there. Pardon me. My nose is going to give me a lot of trouble. So yeah, when you're looking at a spell and you're deciding whether it's going to be useful to you, duration usually indicates a degree of power, but also to um, some things work best if they can work over a long period of time. So something like Mage Armor has a duration of eight hours, and it's not concentration. And that is because the idea is when you cast the spell, we only want to cast it once, and you get the benefit for the whole eight hours before you have to worry about casting it again. So sensible thing with that spell is to cast it at the beginning of your adventuring day, and then uh, after eight hours, you need to reconsider whether you need to continue adventuring or cast it again. Pardon me. I'm really struggling with my nose and, uh, and, the, and the other stuff. Okay, schools of magic. 
So there, the magic or magic is grouped into different types of spells. There's eight categories. Uh, they describe the function of the school of magic. So I'm going to go through each AM, all eight of them, and I'm instead of going into a lot of detail, I'm going to just break it down to the absolute basics. Okay. So abjuration spells. That's protection. Anything to do with protection, it's ab abjuration. Conjuration spells involves the transportation of objects or creatures. So you're moving things around. Divination spells, they reveal information. In some way, you're going to get more information that you had than you had before. Hello, how's it going? Is it Amber? Uh, then enchantment, uh, probably viewed as one of the most evil schools of magic for various reasons. This affects the minds of creatures. Uh, evocation spells, one of my favorite personally, but then I have a problem with, I guess, yeah, fire. Um, manipulating magical energy to destroy or restore something. That's what evocation does. Um, then you've got illusion. Should be pretty obvious what that, that is. Any kind of spell that involves illusion, it, it de it's deceiving or you're deceiving the senses in some way. It could be any sense of a creature. You're changing the way they see things. Necromancy spells, that manipulates the energy of life and death. So necromancy is involved in healing and also in creating death or um, affecting undead in some way. Or un if you are dead, making you not dead anymore. So that's a lot of the resurrection spells are like that, raise dead, reincarnate. Um, and then of course your healing word um, and uh, cure wounds, they're all necromancy um, spells. Transmutation spells, that's all about changing the property of a creature or an object or the environment or just changing the way they look, like reforming them. That's why it's called transmutation. So those are the different types of schools of magic. Uh, the area effect of a, a spell, that varies. You can get quite a few different types. Um, area effects of a spell determine the space that the magic changes something. Uh, whether it be a creature or an object or an environment in some way. Okay, so um, whatever is caught in that area is going to be affected. The types of area effects that you can perform with a spell generally are you can have a line, you can have a, a cone, like as if you were having an ice cream cone, uh, a cube literally is like a box, and you've got a sphere, which is like a ball, and then you've got your cylinder, which is kind of like a, what would it be, um, a map case, a, a cylinder, okay? So those are the different shapes that you can form. Casting a spell, like there's a lot of different ways you can cast a spell. Uh, and, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to highlight five different types. I've probably already talked about this before. There are five different types of spells. And um, ultimately what you're doing here is you are using them for a particular um, purpose. So the first one is your melee attack spell. It's made at close quarter. Uh, it's usually going to involve an attack roll against the target or enemy's armor class. And that kind of spell would be something like Booming Blade, um, Shocking Grasp, that's up close, Inflict Wounds, um, Flame Blade, and then Spiritual Weapon. Kind of falls into the same sort of... Um, um, category the only difference is that the spiritual weapon doesn't need to be right beside you it's still a melee attack from the spiritual weapons position but not necessarily from the caster ranged attack spells they're made at short range or long range depending on what you have they are going to involve an attack roll against the target or enemy's armor class and that would be something like eldritch blast that the warlock has or ray of frost Firebolt, one of my favorites, um, Guiding Bolt, if you can get that to work, and then Chaos Bolt. So those are all sort of ranged attack spells. Then you get the melee saving throw spells. Uh, there aren't actually that many that I could find. I was hunting around, I'm like, uh, there, I'm sure there must be some. So melee saving throws made at close quarter. If I can ever remember what they are, I will let you know. But this, the, the concept is, is a, a saving throw that targets the enemy's um, save of some kind. And as I said, off the top of my head, I could not think of any. Um, 
ranged saving throws. These are spells that are short range or long range with a, a saving throw that targets the enemy. And um, they might be things like, well, they are things like Fireball, Lightning Bolt, Sacred Flame. I know some people call it my Sacred Miss. Uh, and then Toll or Toll the Dead. Like that's, those are all saving throws. And then you've got another bracket of spell, which isn't an attack roll or a saving throw, and they're called the automatic success spells. They don't require an attack roll, they don't require a saving throw, they just work. And these are things like prestidigitation, they have a lot of utility functions to them, uh, mage hand, light, mending, message, uh, magic missile, like you just need to be able to see it, if you can see it, you can hit it. There's no dice roll whatsoever. You're just rolling for damage. And then Droid Craft. Uh, as it happens, much to your surprise, um, I have quite a lot to say about Droid Craft uh, in, the, uh, in the coming days. <laughs> so that is the, the basics around your magic and, and how it works. There's another mechanic, and this is probably the one that people get confused the most about, and that is um, the nature of concentration. If you've ever had to cast a spell in a game and you're dealing with concentration, you've probably gotten a little bit confused. And for good reason, the mechanics behind concentration aren't exactly that easy to understand. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that and then I'm going to go into the, the drowning hole of, of the difference between spells known, prepared spells, and spell slots. And that's like a giant, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're going to get confused by anything, you might as well be confused by that, because I don't think it would be unreasonable to be confused by that. So uh, I'm going to pull up the rules for concentration so that I can show them to you. And I will just hopefully be able to switch straight over to this now if it works. Good. Right. Yes. Okay. So we're, looks like my screen is going to work fine. I will just make that a little bit bigger and we will be able to actually see what's going on. So let's trash it, transition over so that you can see what I'm looking at here. And we'll talk about um, concentration. <clears throat> so you'll notice a little C beside any spell in the description that says concentration or has a C. That means it's a concentration spell. So it's unlike any other spell. It usually designates a spell that's really powerful. It has a lot going on. Um, and... Uh, there's two things to, to remember with this, like you either dealing with the damage that you take or you're dealing with the number 10, okay? So these are spells you have to maintain. You have to keep focusing and con concentrating on them. That doesn't mean you can't cast another spell when your turn comes around, but it does mean that you can only concentrate on one concentration spell. So if you want to cast another spell, it can't be a concentration spell. If you were to do that, you would lose the first concent concentration spell that you have cast. So you don't want to do that, okay? So now you're concentrating on that spell, you want to cast another spell. Can't be another concentration spell because I would lose it. Fine, we've got that worked out. Uh, so you're having to maintain it, and there's usually a duration entry in it, okay? It's not like you can concentrate on that spell indefinitely. There's almost always an entry that says duration. And that's the maximum time that you can concentrate on that spell before it will end, okay? With, you can actually end the concentration spell, the effect that, it's, that it has, at any time. It requires no action by you whatsoever. Uh, you can move around, you can make attacks, doesn't interfere with your concentration. What does affect your concentration is you can lose your spell, your concentration spell that you're um, focusing on uh, if you take damage. Okay, that's the, the key thing is if you take damage. There are other ways that you might be forced to make a concentration check, but that's the one, okay? So when you take damage, you need to make a concentration check. What does that look like? It's actually a constitution saving throw to maintain it. And the DC is a 10, so it's, it's always a 10, or whatever damage you took from a single attack, not from the combined four or five attacks that you suffered, but from a single attack, if you take that single attack and you halve it, so if you did, um, you took on an attack that was 25 um, points of damage, then you'd halve 25, which becomes 12.5. Okay, can't have a 0.5, so it's 12. So do we take 
the 10 or the 12 from the half damage that we took. We take the 12. We always take the highest number. And that's our DC. That's the difficulty class for our constitution saving throw. So if we took 30 points of damage and a single blow, we would need to make a concentration check. It's not going to be 10. It's going to be half the damage we took because if you halve 30, you get 15. 15 is greater than 10. So you always take the highest number. That's the easiest way to understand this. When are you likely to take that kind of damage? When you're dealing with somebody who's doing area effect, when you're dealing with a melee character who can pump out a lot of damage, a dragon breath might do, do that to you as well. Um, if you become incapacitated or, or you are killed, you lose concentration on the spell. That should be pretty obvious, but we'll, we'll make sure that you know that. So you might think, if I'm using a lot of concentration spells, it would be important to have a really good constitution saving throw modifier, correct? And yes it is, absolutely. So that's the basics around concentration. I'm going to go back to the giant cesspool of confusion that I was talking about before, but I want to go to the um, the chat in a second because I can... I can see people pumping in um, stuff. So <clears throat> there's three things we need to break up, okay? Known spells, prepared spells, and spell slots, which unfortunately, they're not the same thing. I wish they would clean this up and make it easier. <clears throat> but let's have a look at our, um, the chat here first. Um, oh, thank you for everybody who showed up today. And I do apologize for the um, the nature of the... Um, the live stream today, it was not my intention to be scrolling through d, d Beyond. My intention was to have a proper slideshow, and it's just it's just not ready. Okay. Um, so, Seeker was saying, possible topics of confusion, focuses. Yes, I've talked about component pouches and focuses, done that. Um, the whole in, in place of material component thing, I've done that, we've covered that. Um, uh yeah, so so the concept of yeah, if you cast a bonus action spell, your action spell must be a cantrip. If you do that, uh, look at everybody's forgotten that one. Uh, it's it's normal. It's all right. It's it's fine. It, you, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> uh, I believe when Critical Role was, they had the home brew um, a home brew uh, rule where you could cast a spell of level one to three and a bonus action spell and everybody thought that was the rule uh, and Matthew Mercer then changed it because he realized everybody was watching his stuff and thought that what he did was actually the standard rules and it wasn't um, caused a lot of confusion <clears throat> Ricketts Ricketts Zero hello uh, you have a question here um, okay so could a character cast a level spell? Yes. A bonus action cantrip? Yeah. And a reaction spell in a round? Uh, so first off, you're never going to find a cantrip that's a bonus action spell. There aren't any. Okay? <clears throat> you, can, you can cast a level spell that's a cantrip and a bonus action spell. And yes, you can have a reaction and you can have them all in the same round. So yes, you can cast Shield in the same round uh, same round, as you cast something like Misty Step, and then you cast the Firebolt cantrip with your, your action. That can all be done in one round. Of course, what it would look like is you cast either Misty Step first, and then you cast your um, Firebolt, or you cast your Firebolt with your action, and then you do a Misty Step with your bonus action, and then you have a reaction spell later on when somebody tries to attack you, and you put up your shield and you use your reaction to stop it. So that can all happen in the same round. Okay? Uh, thank you for being here, Big Clue. I do appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what Fred says. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think I've under, I think I've answered your question with regard to that. Um, yep, we'll move on. Yeah, it's easiest way concentration. It's half the damage or ten, whichever is highest. You're welcome. I'm, if that helped you playing playing the game, great. 
We're going to get to the cesspool of problems and confusion in a second. Don't you worry. <laughs> How's it going, Han Solo? And thank you. Yes, do hit the like button. I do appreciate it. Satori, hey. Now, Satori, did I get your name right? I'm not sure if I did. But if I did, cool. If I didn't, you'll let me know. Okay? <laughs> okay. Um, Stone and Shillelagh are bonus action cantrips. Are they? Yeah, they are, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Um... <laughs> Yes, so he says, there's no bonus action cantrips. And yes, there is in fact bonus action cant cantrips. How did, how, did that, how did that work? Clearly, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, let me just have a quick look here. I think you're probably right there. I was just thinking back to how they are used. And um, shillelagh. I don't use shillelagh very much. Frankly, I've never found it to be that good. Shillelagh is a bonus action cantrip. That's right. It is. And then, um, what is it? Magic stone. Magic stone. Magic stone. Magic stone. Uh, it is an M. It starts with an M. Magic stone. Let me see. Let me see. Why can't I find magic stone? Is it not in this book? Maybe it's not in the player's handbook. That's probably what it is, is it's not in this book. All right, okay, let's not worry about that. Okay, now, next. Um, what do you got here, Seeker? Well, hang on, what was this? Uh, no, that's that's fine. Seeker. Um, how could you do shield plus misty step and a cantrip? Both leveled? Uh, okay, so, um, that's a good question. My understanding is you can do it as long, I'm pretty sure you can do it as long as it's not, the reaction is not done on your turn. I'm pretty sure you can do that. I may be wrong. Um, I had to do a, a video on this years ago. It might be six years from um, ago that I did a video. So you, you may well find that you can still do that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm now thinking I might have to actually look that up to, to, to see how that works. Um, but my understanding is as long as the reaction doesn't take place on your turn, you're all right. But I could be, I could be mistaken. Um, I wonder if I can find this. We'll come back to Mr. Cess Pull in a second. Uh, what is the spell? And let's see if we can find the bonus action spell. <clears throat> bonus action spell. Here we go. Casting times. A spell cast with a bonus action is especially swift. You must use a bonus action on your turn to cast the spell. Fair enough. We've got that. Provided that you haven't already taken a bonus action this turn. You can't cast another spell during the same turn. Here we go. There's the, there's the difference. During the same turn, except for a cantrip with a casting time of one action. So I am right. Oh God, thank God I've got something right today. Okay, so as long as the bonus action spell that you cast is on your turn and you've only used one bonus action on your turn and your action is used to cast a, um, a cantrip, when you take your reaction, as long as your reaction doesn't take place on your turn and occurs on somebody else's turn, not your turn, you're all right because it says here, you can't cast another spell during the same turn, turn, not round, except for a cantrip with a casting time of one action. Okay? So that's that would be that would be the uh, the criteria for that. So you can do it in the same round, just not the same turn. So you can do a reaction on somebody else's um, turn, your bonus action on your turn, your action on your turn, and you're all good. Yep. Okay, we've got we got that. We nailed that down. Um, so Tori, uh, thanks. Uh, you're welcome. I'm glad you're finding the uh, the videos useful, <clears throat> even as an old timer. Okay, all right. Uh, so I I do these. So if you hadn't figured it out, I do these videos so that you 
can direct your players who are having trouble with the game rules to somewhere where they can ask questions and hopefully get the right answer. And uh, and also too, um, I will once I get everything sorted out, I will cut them into smaller segments so that you can kind of find them quickly and refer your players to them. And if you are a player and you're just trying to find stuff fast and you want to ask the question online, you can do that. But not only that, I can then cut them into shorter um, videos that you can just look for and use the search option on Google. Don't search on YouTube. Search engine on YouTube is garbage. doesn't work any good. It's, it's, it's not designed. It's all it's trying to do is get you to watch more videos and whichever video is getting the most likes and being viewed the most is the one they're going to feed you. But the Google engine is much better than the YouTube engine. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm um, thank you for uh, the kind words. Yes, yeah. I, I, it's like, what? How is he? How can he possibly talk about magic and not have memorized and know every single rule and spell back to front, like? Ah, I don't know. Um, Tur Trooper. Look, I hope I got your name right. Hello, welcome. Um, yeah, Elemental Evil Players Companion. Well, that would be, that would explain a lot. Yeah, as long as you don't do the, the shield on your turn, you're all good. Yes, you can have a, a reaction can occur on your turn. Um... It doesn't happen very often because the trigger usually requires somebody else to do something. There are some, it's very rare that it takes place, but it is possible. And it might be in response to another reaction taking place. So to give you an idea of how ridiculous this can look, right? If you decide to use, say, for example, your action to ready the counter spell spell okay you want to counter spell something and your your the trigger that you set up for your um uh your readied action with your counter spell is when you see um i don't know say for example uh an enemy attack you and that's your that's the trigger that you've set up and uh, the trigger that the dungeon master set up with their monster is, as soon as you see somebody try to cast a spell, I'm going to shoot uh, a, uh, say, a, a magic missile or a fire, fireball in their direction. And so you have the interplay of two reactions, which is a giant pain in the butt. <laughs> and if it doesn't confuse you, confuse you I, I don't know what will, okay? But there are some very peculiar times when this might take place. It doesn't happen very often, but it can. Uh, <laughs> right, cool. We got that sorted out. Now, now let's go back to the third fest of magic. And uh, the third fest of magic is this one. Known spells, prepared spells, and spell slots. What the heck is the difference between these things? So the first thing to understand is known spells. These are the spells that you actually know. Now, whether they're in your spell book because you're a wizard or whether you're a sorcerer or a bard or a warlock, it doesn't really matter, okay? Um, this doesn't always apply to every single spellcaster, but there are some um, spellcasters that have spells that they know. And there's a limited list based on the, the complete list, right? And so those are the spells they know, but that doesn't mean that they can cast all those spells. They then have a shorter list of what's called prepared spells. And the prepared spells are the ones they selected at the beginning of their adventuring day, usually, um, almost always, actually, uh, that they will cast. And so that's a shorter list than the known spells. And then spell slots is a, yet a shorter list again, usually, because you don't get that many spell slots, and you can only cast a certain number of spells per day, and they're going to be of a certain level. So you may, if you're starting out, you probably only get two first level spells if you are a, a wizard, uh, and that changes. And then as you get higher and higher in level, then you get a certain number of second level spells and third level spells, and that's it. So... 
That's the difference between it. And if it doesn't sound confusing, trust me, everybody gets confused by this. Magic was not nearly as complicated as it is now in 5e with regard to known spells, prepared spells, and spell slots. It has actually been done better in the past, if you ask me. Right now, I still don't understand why um, sorcerers are not spontaneous casters. That basically means they can cast every spell on their spell list. <laughs> they might have a very short list, but they can cast everything. Okay. Let me go through here. Let's have a look. What else have we got in terms of questions? Um, and I might actually... Oh, I should mention... Does anybody remember that I did some videos, some live streams and some videos on clever uses of Mage Hand, clever use of uh, Minor Illusion, uh, clever use of, now was there another one? I think there was. Uh, I can't remember. I know those two I've definitely done. Guess what? Tomorrow I'm doing clever uses of uh, Droidcraft, a very difficult spell to use. And it's taken me this long to get it together, okay? I don't even know how long the prestidigitation one's going to take me to figure out. But oh, I've also done shape water. Shape water is a very good cantrip, and so I wanted to talk about that. So clever uses of shape water. So I've done three cantrips that uh, have lots of different uses, and I've called them clever uses of, okay? But tomorrow, we're doing droid craft. For those of you who have always poo-pooed droid craft, I feel like you're going to get a surprise. No more among, among Us memes. No more Among Us memes? I didn't even notice those memes. Hello, how are you? <laughs> All right, so let's let's have a look here. Um, Trooper, what's Trooper saying here? So you've got your, here's your, your criteria. Um... Okay, right. No, no, you can't. No, you can't. So you can cast a, a bonus action spell that is a cantrip, but your action still needs to be a cantrip. Does that make sense? So no, you wouldn't be able to cast Bless as an action and then the bonus action be Shillelagh. So that's not going to work, unfortunately. Okay, Um I think one of the worst things they've ever done for Dungeons and Dragons 5e is including the concept of bonus action spells. Uh, I mean, I love spell casters, but spell casters are powerful enough. They don't need to have bonus actions going on. They really don't. I know part of the reason and rationale behind that, and this is not really, I'm not really here to um, spout my philosophy on Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm going to do it very quickly. Like, if you want to confuse somebody, then have bonus action spells and action spells. Like, that's certainly going to confuse people and then have different ways that it's going to interact um just an action you cast a spell almost all magic is significantly more impressive than anything the other classes can do reality and i'm not just talking about doing damage i mean everything else that's it's the stuff that doesn't do damage that's really impressive okay because a lot of the other classes can't do it so why do we need to lift them up and say the way they've done it is because they want um, uh, the, the cleric to be able to cast healing word with a bonus action and also make an attack or cast another spell which would be a cantrip yep uh, because a lot of people hated playing the cleric and all they would do is be a heal bot and run around just healing everybody so now they thought well we can solve the problem of people playing a cleric by giving them a bonus action spell the healing word and that's really where a lot of this comes from um, okay so I think I've answered your question, Trooper. Okay. Um, yes, big clue. Uh, that, that's right. They are. But no, you'll find you'll find that the the description with regard to how bonus action spells work, there, there is no confusion around it. Okay. Okay, it's very, very clear that when you cast a bonus action spell, the, the action that you use has to be a cantrip. Okay, so, uh, so you don't, don't think that there's any confusion around that. There, there really isn't. Yep. 
Like, now let's, I think we've kind of covered a lot of that stuff. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty around um, magic, magic and like, what's a good thing to do? One of the things that I noticed that they are playing around with, if I find it, I will uh, point to the right direction. Um, no, no, no area. Cones, cubes, um, saving throws, attack rolls. Where is it? I, I know it's here somewhere. No, it's not there. Where are, come on, come on, you, you silly thing. I want to talk about ritual spells. Um, where are you? I know they're here. Da, da, da. Here we go, here we go. Here's the section on ritual spells. So there are tags to some spells that are classified as a ritual. And I want to highlight this because a lot of people miss this point. If you are not a wizard, okay, or a class that has ritual casting, where you can learn spells that you can cast as a ritual, which basically means you don't use any of your spell slots when you cast it. And as long as you take 10 minutes plus the casting time, which quite often is one action or 60, um, six seconds, so 10 minutes plus six seconds or whatever the casting time of that spell is, particularly with utility spells, you can cast them like an infinite number of times because you have ritual casting. So when you're a wizard, and even if you are a sorcerer um, or a bard or a cleric, if you don't have, as part of your class, ritual casting as a feature, because not all of them do, go get the ritual casting feat, okay? Go get it, because seriously, it's going to make it possible for you to do so much more than you could do before. One of the most common things when you're spellcaster is wanting to, to, to cast something like Detect Magic. You do, you're do going to use Detect Magic so much in the game. It's such a common spell, and it's it can be cast as a ritual. So why would you not use that over and over again? Like, I, I just don't understand why people don't. So if you don't have ritual casting as part of your class, go get the feat if you're allowed to use feats. As soon as an opportunity arises, go grab that, okay? And then you can't, you're, not, you're never going to get that many slots to spend stuff on. So you can only prepare so many, even if you know a certain number of spells. You can only prepare so many spells, yeah? But this makes the big, this is the big difference, is having that ritual cast defeat. It actually, it's, it's so important to pick it up. Um, and it's just, just around to tech magic. There are other spells that are rituals as well, and that make a big difference with regard to actually doing anything in the game with magic. Um, usually when I am playing any kind of spell caster, I will usually pick up some key spells that I want to use that I will prepare, and the rest are going to be rituals. That's if I'm a wizard. If I'm not a wizard, then I have to retool and rethink the way I do things. With a warlock, it's complicated because you're using invocations. So ritual casting as a, a warlock, nah, that's not going to work. Um, but uh, anybody who doesn't have uh, ritual casting, that's a different story. Um, so let's just, I wanted to see if I can find the entry here in my book and just talk just very briefly about just how important this thing is. Um, I mean, I, I suppose I, at some point I should just make up a big list of ritual spells that you probably should try to grab as quickly as possible. I don't know how useful that is to people because it's not like you can't find that information. It is out there. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so ritual casting, ritual casting. Uh, here we go, here we go. Here's the entry. And... So you need to have an intelligence or a wisdom that is 13 or higher. Usually you're going to have that. If you're a spellcaster, uh, the only time it's not going to apply is if you are a charisma-based caster, right? That's that's your only hassle. Um, so it's still kind of important to make sure you have one of those kind of pimped out a little bit. It, doesn't have to be the, it only has to be a 13, okay? Um, you have learned a number of spells that you can cast as a ritual, these spells are written in a ritual book. So you have your own ritual book for these ones particularly, uh, which you must have uh, in your hand while casting one of them, which is fine because you're going to be using 10 minutes plus the casting time anyway. It won't make any difference. Uh, when you choose this, um, this, this feat, you acquire a ritual book um, holding two first level spells of your choice. Now that's not that much, but don't worry. Choose one of the following classes, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard. I recommend going with Wizard because you get more of most of the stuff. 
Um, you must choose your spells from the class list, um, spell list, and the spells you choose must have the ritual tag. So that obviously, that should be pretty obvious. Um, the class you choose also determines your spell casting ability for the spell. So, Charisma is for bards, sources. This is the one area where it becomes a pain in the ass. So that means it is smart if you're going to go with um, something like uh, picking up the, the spell list for the wizard, which is really what you want because that's where so many of the ritual uh, rituals are, then you need to make sure you're, you've got a 13 in, in, in intelligence. Okay, Otherwise you're kind of restricted in terms of the spell list. That's that little proviso there and that feat. How's it going, Spirit Wolf? Hello. Um, Jampy. Jampy, is it, did, I, did I get Jampy right? If I got your name right, great. <laughs> is spellcasting good for a all-starring party? Um, well, you, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's bad. Spellcasting is fine. If you want to have a whole party... Look, my group tried to show up one day with a whole... With the whole group were going to be were wizards. Like a whole party of wizards is, is a pain. Do you know what's t the most terrifying possibility though for me? Um, and who is this? This is, uh, uh, is it Jampy? Jampy? Is if they were to show up and they were all clerics. I don't know if I, that, like if I had a whole party of clerics, oh my God. Because there are a lot of different um, subclasses to the cleric. <laughs> It would be a bit of a nightmare. Um, so let me just go back to this rit ritual um, uh, ritual cast defeat. If you come across a spell in written form, such as a magical scroll or a wizard spell book, uh -huh, um, you might be able to add it to your ritual book. The spell must be of the spell list for your class you choose. The spell level can be no higher than half your level rounded up. And you must have the ritual tag. Okay, so that's pretty obvious. So that's quite useful though. That means that if you have a wizard in your party, uh, you can copy out some of the spells from their spell book that they, where they have rituals. And wizards usually have lots of rituals, right? Um, the process of copying from the, the, the spell into your ritual book takes two hours per level of spell. The vast majority of the best ritual um, spells are that have a ritual tag on them are level one anyway. So who cares? That's fine. Two hours, one spell. And it's going to cost you 50 gold pieces. At some point, you won't care about how much gold you've got, okay? Uh, you'll have plenty of money. The cost represents the material components you expend as you experiment with the spell, blah de blah de blah ink and so forth and recording. So a few provisors with the use of a ritual, um, ritual casting, but I, I highly reckon people, do, like, Get hold of it. If you aren't a ritual caster already, um, you, you want that. And you, you want to poach from the wizard um, spell list whenever possible. Okay. Uh, just a drink of water and I will go back to um, the chat. Sorry if I am not keeping up with you as quickly as I would hope. Now, um, I'm going to go forward a little bit here. Spells. There's a lot of spells here. Uh, we're we're going to talk about spells, some maybe some specific spells in a second. Um, I just need to make sure I haven't lost anybody. I am I'm probably well behind on your chat, so uh, because I've been talking so much. Uh, look, each one of them, each one of them, one of them has their their benefits. You remember, not every class can take prestidigitation. Uh, not every class can take druidcraft. Um, or thermatology. So you you kind of you have to figure out how to use them, and uh, that's that's the that's the the key to all of it. You don't ha you're not open to all of them, um, as you're probably already aware. Okay, so mm -hmm. yep. That's right. So if you use your bonus action in Shillelagh, uh, you would use your main action to attack with your, your quarterstaff at that point. That, that, that's the whole point of that, that particular spell, yes. Um, yep, yeah, same with Booming Blade. You cast that cantrip. Right, uh, so where are we? What's your point here? 
Shillelagh and Booming Blade. They're very, look, if you if you don't understand how those spells interact and work, it's best to leave them alone. But if you understand, because there's a, there's a learning curve to those, this is why I don't, I never recommend beginners start with Booming Blade and um, I mean, Shillelagh is, is fine. Uh, it, it's fine at low level, at higher levels it just doesn't seem to work out, unfortunately. The rogue barbarian is OP. Uh, frankly, the rogue anything is OP. Uh, <laughs> if you combine rogue with another martial class, it's usually pretty OP. That's, I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> is spell casting good uh, for all star? And uh, we've already covered that. Jeremy Crawford today hinted that one DND may let anyone with a spell with a ritual tag be able to cast it as a ritual. Also, instead of needing the feet, laugh out loud. We'll see. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Do you know? I know. I know. For for a lot of people, I might be thinking, well, that just makes a lot of the other spell casters even more powerful than they were before, and makes them more on par with the wizard, um, and the wizard becomes weaker in comparison. And frankly, look, I don't know if they're going to do that, but if they do, I would be happy. I love wizards, but I also know that, and I like monks as well, but um, I, I know that it is a very strong class. Um, I still know that as a, as a wizard, when you're playing a wizard or any kind of spellcaster, but particularly a wizard or a sorcerer, if you don't stay out of harm's way and stay in the back line, you are toast. Like, you know, um, I expect monsters to kill my wizard as soon as they get the opportunity. <laughs> um, but I actually like this idea. I think this that would simplify things. That means getting rid of the, the ritual caster feat completely. I would love if they did that big clue. Um, another thing that I, I like the idea is that there are spells that you can learn that you can just use and spend 10 minutes to just do it because it's utility. And I like the idea of opening up the spell casters to more utility spells rather than damage dealing boom um, nuclear bombs like fireball okay uh, another thing that I don't think it'll happen I would like it if when you get a uh, spell casting class and you get access to cantrips that you just get to cast all of the cantrips on that spell spell list for that class do you know what I mean so that means if you were playing, let's say, a uh, a warlock, for example, would be a great example. Our cantrips for a warlock are um, Blade Ward in the Player's Handbook, Chill Touch, Eldritch Blast. Eldritch Blast should be only av available to a warlock, in my opinion. It shouldn't be available to anybody else. This is my just my personal. I'm not actually explaining rules now. Now I'm just giving my opinion, aren't I? God almighty. Tell me to shut up if I need to, people. Okay? Um... But friends, you get Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, Poison Spray, Prestidigitation, and True Strike. Ugh, okay, True Strike. But for me, when you gain that class and you get those cantrips, I would like people to be able to use all those cantrips. The zero level spells. Just let them use the whole lot. Don't need to choose a small sample of those zero level spells. The other things, the other spells, level 1 to 9, different story completely. I totally get it. Make them choose. Understandable. Okay? Particularly for a wizard. Particularly for a wizard. Don't know about a cleric. I feel a bit differently about the cleric. Or even the sorcerer. I'm like, why? Why make them choose? Um, there, there, there should be some benefits to not playing a wizard, right? <laughs> uh, so, yes. I would be very... Very happy if they did something like that. But you guys may disagree. That's fine. Um, Spirit Wolf. Hello. How's it going? Uh, let me just move on down here. Detect magic. Comprehend languages. Identify. Find familiar. Yes. Unseen servant. Lemon's tiny hut. <laughs> oh, God almighty. Can you not? You don't want to. That's an awesome spell. Like that solves so many resting problems, doesn't it? Uh, water breathing. Speak with animals, etc. Yes, absolutely. They are all ritual um, casting spells. They are things you want to get a hold of. Um, and you'll use them a lot. Maybe not Maybe not something like um, speak with animals unless you are um, talking to a lot of animals. Well, no, that's not necessarily true at all. Like, you know, if you can build up a decent relationship with the local squirrel population, who knows? Um, <laughs> 
the Dallas. Hello, Dallas. Um, da- the Dallas. Uh, the Dallas is a patron and supports me on um, Patreon to make sure I can keep running this class. Um, and actually, if you want to support me to keep doing this every week, so every week we will do this sort of thing, uh, same time and day. I know it's cha- the time's changed a little bit because I'm in a different part of the world and so we have daylight savings sort of m- moving around. But um, the best way is through Patreon, a uh, dollar a month. You get everything that I put onto Patreon and you support these classes continuing every week. And of course, there are four four that I run for this and there's a Q&A for all of them and then eventually we'll get the demonstration back up and running and then hopefully the participation aspect will run into it as well. So um, that means the basics of the rules, the basics around combat, the um, complex combat stuff, the magic um, um mechanics we cover and then i just roll it around so we'll go back to the basics of dungeons and dragons next week and it's just an ongoing thing it it won't stop until i take a break like a holiday or something like that Um, otherwise super chat and super super stickers always appreciate it but i always recommend people go for patreon because frankly i get more of the money you can pay less and uh, you get a lot of stuff you don't you just get access to a lot of stuff okay now, um, how co- um, how often should wizards dis- discover spells? Uh, Cole, hello Cole, uh, that's really up to you, it depends. How's it going global product and game gaming review? So I found that uh, if you have a wizard or somebody who wants to find spells to scribe into a book, um, it's really a bit of a struggle because, you know, like how often and where do you put them? Because it's a lot of the, for a lot for them, it's a big deal. I think what you might want to do and, and consider is that when, when your player who's got money wants to learn new spells, they can go back to wizard school or go back to the, um, the wizards guild or the may and the magic comes um, guild or the, um, arcane guild or whatever it is and they can go and see a more powerful wizard or caster and learn spells from them rather than having to find a magic shop or find a scroll specifically or um, uh, venture into the realm of hoping to steal spell books off other spell casters and then scribe them into their own book um, that's, that's what I would suggest to you. Um, Cole is like, probably just let them go back to, um, their, their magic guild or magic school. Yeah, it, it is one of the more one hour break. Is it, it is one hour. It is. You're right. Okay. Thank you for the reminder, Spirit Wolf. Um, is there any way to defeat a Tarrasque with magic? don't don't use magic don't use magic on the Tarrasque probably use something else (laughs) Um, we'll come back to your question don't go away because I am just going to uh, flick out of here for a second I'll go to my I'll be back my break I will be I will be back don't you worry don't go away ask me questions hashtag where are you where are you hashtag ask me hard questions give me a question i can't answer that i have no idea about that would be quite quite fun questions here we go all right i'll be back
Okay. Here we go. I believe we're back. <clears throat> and we're in. There. Oh, okay. Right, so. Um, a drink of water. And then we'll go back to the chat. And we'll work our way through whatever questions we need to deal with. Okay. Right, lozenger for me. Here we go. What do we got here? Um, well, it keeps popping up. Uh, uh, the the Tarask. Somebody was asking about the Tarask with magic. Where's the monster manual? <clears throat> the problem is, Tarask is a creature that uh, is designed to not be affected by <laughs> magic. For good reason. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is have the um, the Tarask banished. Like, it was there and now it's gone. Um, it's anticlimactic. It makes a mockery of that creature. Now, if I can just find this thing. Here we go. Um, so magic missile doesn't work on it, but there's another feature here as well. Um, blah, 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 blah. So it bounces that one. Where's the other? Where's the the thing that we're talking about here that causes so much trouble for people? It's not advantage. It's not succeeding. There's something else here. I just can't see it for the life of me. Is it, Am I blind? Um, dun, 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 dun. Okay, any time the Tarask is targeted by a, um, by a magic missile spell, a line spell or a spell that requires a ranged attack roll, Okay, roll a 1d5, the Trask is unaffected. On a 6, the Trask is, um, is unaffected and the effect is reflected. So, how would you deal with a Trask with magic? Don't cast magic missile at it. Pretty obvious, right? Um, again, if it has a... If the spell is a line, then you don't want to use it either. Like, it's going to have to be an area effect spell. It can't be a line spell. And it can't have an attack roll. A ranged attack roll, bad idea. Okay, you could make an attack roll if it's a melee character, uh, melee um, spell, but that would be stupid. So don't do that either, because you don't want to be right next to a Tarask if you're a spellcaster. So that means saving throw spells. Uh, your best um, best bet, and nothing that in, uh, involves a line. To just deal with the fact that you're going to wind up with things not working or just being um, redirected back at you. Which is bad. <laughs> That's how you deal with the Tarask and magic. Okay. Uh, so global product and gaming review. The reason that um, dungeon masters are um, concerned about players being um, overpowered and too powerful is because it's a lot of extra work for them to do that. Now you might be fine, and I might be fine with that, but even even I have my limits. Do you mean? So. Um, and the, the biggest issue I think you'll find is usually around combat rather than other aspects of the game. There are certainly some spells that just sort of um, poo-poo over all of the Dungeon Master's hard work. So there has to be, there has to be a, a nice balancing act so the Dungeon Masters get everything that they need and the players are getting what they need as well. Okay, We can't give everything to the players and we can't give everything to the Dungeon Masters but if you don't give the Dungeon Masters a bigger piece of the pie, since they're the ones who make sure the game happens, no Dungeons and Dragons happens. Okay? And that, that's the reality is, if you don't give the Dungeon Master a bigger piece of the pie, then uh, with regard to how the game is run, then they don't run the game. Uh, they don't have to. They shouldn't have to, frankly. Do you know what I mean? Um, to make it clear... I run a channel talking a lot of talking a lot about being a dungeon master, but I play more than I do dungeon master, as JP knows very well. 
uh, memes. Polymorph is the de facto spell for our group with Fred throws nasty monsters at us. Yes, that's that'd be about right. <laughs> okay. You could cast Wish, but then Wish solves pretty much everything, doesn't it? Unless, of course, it backfires on you, which is always possible. Um, but also entertaining, too. Okay, Cole, what do you got here? Um, how would I feel about a vendor selling spells at premium? Sure, okay. Uh, and then the caster can spend a long rest to learn a spell, plus whatever amount of gold it takes to scribe it in. Try it out. Um, as a player, I don't know. It depends. I, I'd have to. I'd have to see how it, it feels when I I'm playing the game. Do you know? It's you. You can look. You only, you only know if these things are going to work unless you try them. If it doesn't work the first time, try it again. If you're starting to notice a pattern and it's still not working for you, and nobody seems to be biting on, then maybe it's not going to work. Okay. There are plenty of groups that are going to be fine with this. Plenty of players that would be fine with that. Uh, there are other players who would be unropeable and would threaten to leave your group. But that's tantrum childish shit. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, would I do that myself as a dungeon if I was being a dungeon master? I kind of just described what I would probably do. I use I magic I use magic vendors where you can buy certain level spells. Not everything. Um, but I would also be open to the idea if somebody said, look, I want to go back to my original school where I learned my magic and I want to learn some more powerful magic, not beyond the spell level that I can cast at, but I just want to learn more stuff because I have the spell book and it's kind of empty. Or, um, I, I'm a warlock and I have this, this tome, um, but I want to fill it up a bit more or you know, whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I feel like there needs to be some sort of, the way that magic and spells works in Dungeons and Dragons 5e, I'm not, I'm not a fan of it, frankly. I feel like it's just a bit too complicated and a little bit too heavy-handed at times. Does that answer your question, Cole? I apologise for lozenger in my mouth. Uh, not really a magic question. That's all right. You can ask me whatever question that you like, as long as you don't ask me. Um, about politics, religion, and what is the other thing? Uh, my personal sex life. That would be probably bad questions to be asking. But uh, Dungeons and Dragons questions, roleplay game questions, all good. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Oh. How do you go about determining the proficiency bonus and a, we a weapon has for a character? It is, is it added to damage or the attack? Okay. Proficiency bonuses are only added to the attack roll uh, for a weapon. Okay. You never add your proficiency bonus to the damage roll. That It never gets it, um, attached to that. Uh, so, yeah. Hopefully that answered your question, um, Cole. It, it's usually it's usually pretty, um, pretty easy to figure out because it's spelled out in the book. But if you find... Look, let's get real... It's a big book. It, it's a it's a it's a sodding textbook. You might as well go be going back to school and have to learn mathematics all over again, or algebra or something like that. Um, I know for some people are like, nah, it's not nearly that um, complicated. But for you, it's e easy. For other people, it's not so easy. This is why I do these classes in the first place. Um, how do I feel about silvery barbs? Spectra now. Um, Spectra Prismatic is a patron, by the way. Um, I really like silvery barbs. It's like a narcotic drug. And I found myself, when we were using it in my group, uh, at a point where there was no limit to the number of times that I was willing to use it. I was happy to use all of my level 1 spell slots on it and use cantrips as my action um, if, if, if that was going to be coming up on my turn. So I would use all of Silvery Barbs would be a reaction every single time, of course, and every time I cast a spell, I would just use um, cantrips on my turn. Like, that would be it. So I was never doing that much damage, or doing that much, and so, so to speak, on my turn. But on somebody else's turn, I was screwing the dungeon master up big time. 
and assisting my allies with advantage and um, forcing a reroll on my uh, dungeon master's monsters and you just kind of own the whole situation. So I would do that with level 1 spells. Heck, I was using up level 2 slots as well. And if I had gotten access to level 3 spells, I probably would have used the level 3 spells as well. Um, so as a result, our group played with it for a number of months and we decided, almost all of us decided to ban it. I think there was one person who said, it's too good, we've got to keep it. But we, yeah, I think ultimately we understood that it was, it was too good a spell and it needed to go. Now, if we were playing in a campaign... Uh, where everybody was a wizard or a spellcaster and it was, it was like mage wars or and there was lots of spell dueling going on then it makes sense to have shield, counter spell and silvery barbs. Yep, but if that's not the type of campaign you're playing silvery barbs is just too good. And um, I, yeah, I, I I, I, I'm, I'm not ultimately, I mean, I was sad initially to see Silvery Barbs go, but now that it's gone, I'm like, okay, we, we're actually now playing a game where I don't feel like I can get away with everything. <laughs> Is it possible to solo a um, an adventure? Um, the Tub Man. Hello, Tub Man. Uh, so I'm currently working on some notes. One of the patrons, um, Alec, is in a situation where he has to play solo, he can't actually join games because of his work. So you're going to get a video in the future pointing you in the direction of how to play Dungeons & Dragons solo. I don't personally know very much about it, so I have to do a lot of research. So I can't give you a time frame on, on that. Um, I did give all the resources for it to the patron who was needing that assistance uh, that I had. Um, but it's not it's not like an unlimited resource. Uh, I haven't sort of done everything I need to with that. I expect it might take me a little while to, to get through that. I notice people are looking for that sort of thing on my channel. And so um, I, I definitely will work towards building a, uh, a live stream or a video around that topic. But so yes, you can solo an adventure. It just depends on the adventure and what you do with it. So yeah, we'll come back to that some other time. Okay, so Jean-Paul is in my group. And so he, he was there when we were using Silvery Barbs. So if you see his comments and you're wondering what's going on here, that's, that's what's going on here. Would the Silvery Barbs negate the um, Tarasque's advantage against ranged uh, magic spells? It's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't, I don't think it would. I don't think it would. Now, why is that? Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it more. JP, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to do a bit of research. Off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of an answer for that question. Yeah, and so to understand it, like it's not like our dungeon master banned silvery barbs from our group. Like our, our the the vast majority of our group, apart from one member, said no, nah, it has to go. Yeah, I I, I was the I was definitely a, a major culprit, if not the key culprit in abusing it. There was one other member who had silvery barbs as well, and when I didn't have silvery barbs to use, he would use his. <laughs> So two people using silvery barbs equals shit on the dungeon master's monsters. Okay. <laughs> Interesting um, spectra there. I feel like there's too many house rolls you would have to put in place to deal with silvery barbs. So we just got rid of it. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, Seeker, what do you got here? How do I feel about replacing uh, costly components for a gold cost to avoid um, gathering uh, gathering chores? Or cells are a range of magic... Cells are a rare magic feather. Um, look, 
you can use a spell casting focus to eliminate most of the material costs of a spell anyway. So I, I don't know why we would worry too much about that. Um, I'm going to go back to my other screen. We don't need to be here at present. So I'm going to just go back to my face. Um, when we need to go and refer to anything specifically that somebody comes up, then I will go, I'll go back to there. But we don't need to do that right now. So let's just go here instead. Uh, and I will answer... I will answer off the screen here. There we go. That's better. Um, so seek out. I just want to find your question here. There we go. So yeah. So and and any kind of spell that sort of involves a monetary cost uh, that you can't use a spell casting focus for. I kind of like the fact that, that those sorts of things exist because it, it 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 puts in place sort of some balances and checks for a spellcaster. Otherwise, spellcasters kind of get to do everything. Um, and one of the biggest problems for the other classes who don't cast spells is most of their class features are combat-focused, and they can't really do anything else. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so when, when you have a, a person who plays a martial class rather than a spellcaster, they get very jealous about the fact that they spellcasters get to do everything, and that's because they just don't have enough stuff. The ranger is probably one, and the and the rogue is probably the only ones that I can think of that have some other things they can do that are outside of combat. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Ugly widow. Yes, my 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 Discord is public, so let me find it for you now. Um, I haven't been there a lot recently, but I have been like super busy. There, there's there's a reason why I haven't been there, and I, I mean I, I do plan to spend time there. I just haven't been able to recently. Um, here we go. Copy that. I close this, I guess, in a second. When I find there, we go. We'll put this in here. Here's the link. You should find the link in the about section, but sometimes these links get old. And they, they discontinue. Right? So, um, yeah, that link might not work forever. <laughs> Just bear that in mind. <laughs> could, could, I might have to drop it in there again later at some other point. Um, yeah, so with regard to the, the components um, cost of anything, I, I, I think it's fine the way it is. Um, Spectra, you're... Uh, so we're moving along here. The same way I described you, yeah, like, look, it's it's too easy. Ugly Weirdo, solo is my bag, is it? How's it going, Ugly Weirdo? Um, that's that's fine, I'll see you, no more um, Among Us uh, memes, I'll see you later. If you're probably already gone, <laughs> that's alright, that's no problem. So, that's magic, um, in terms of the, the basics I guess the other thing that um, at some point we will wind up doing, for those of you who are wondering what the heck was going on with today, like this this isn't what normally I would do, right? Um, I can assure you that once the desk is clear and all the lights have showed up and they're all mounted, we'll get the battle mat out and the miniatures and I'll roll dice and move miniatures around and explain stuff. I'll get my little whiteboard out. Um, we'll do all of that, okay? And the intention ultimately is to assist those people who are really struggling with getting to grips with things. I know you can kind of get a gist of stuff by watching um, some of the, the live plays, but they don't really explain everything to you, so it's, sometimes it's a bit hard. Hi, how's it going, um, Dinomancer? Dinomancer is also a patron um, who supports me on Patreon to make sure these classes keep going. There's, there's a lot of people who are um, supporting this. <clears throat> and Seeker supports me in a different way. Uh, global product and gaming. Uh, okay. Do I think every race should have a feat at level 1? No. I think that's what people... Um, the, I think what that's what the, the majority of the player base would like. But I don't think they should have it. Um, I think it's going to happen because, and it's going to be tied into backgrounds because 
Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons 5e is concerned that they cannot keep up with Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And Pathfinder has always been um, a very complicated game to understand, with a high learning curve designed primarily for the nerdiest of the nerds, frankly, uh, who like maths, who like complexity, who thrive on it, and Dungeons and Dragons 5e has prospered and done so well because it doesn't focus on that. Uh, and that's the mistake they will make, I suspect. Um, we'll see, but I think that's where we're going. Based on all of the survey information they seem to be collecting, which of course only certain people actually answer, um, I, I think it's, I, I, I just don't think that every race needs to have a feat at level one. Um, I still like the idea that feats should not be in the player's handbook and they should be in the Dungeon Master's Guide. They should be truly optional. They shouldn't be something the players look and say, whoa, I want this. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't mean that players don't buy the Dungeon Master's Guide, but the vast majority don't buy the Dungeon Master Guide, even if they want to get hold of the magic items in the Dungeon Master Guide. Um, so, yeah. And, and the same with uh, multi-classing. If you're going to make it optional, then put it in the variant rule book, which is the Dungeon Master Guide. Um, okay. That's my that I've just had so we'll forget about that move on um, I'll just have people just joined <laughs> I'll get to it at some point <laughs> um, didn't know I had one okay so for those of you who don't realize I don't really publicize and talk too much about my discord because the discord I mean you guys are welcome to do whatever in that community there. Um, as long as you're nice to each other and get along and, you know, I don't really, don't don't text me in that in that Discord because you won't get me. But if I'm in the lounge, um, I'll be on video chat or voice chat, mostly video chat. You can just come and talk to me um, over um, video or voice. That's the whole purpose of Discord is, um, is to get us to come and talk to me. And as a result of doing that, a lot of the programs that I've developed are, are, are a response to talking to people over Discord and the sorts of things they were interested in and trying to figure out what would be most useful to you. And so therefore I decided to build a, a class for building characters for beginners, um, covering the core rules since that's where I sort of built my channel on, uh, going over dungeon master preparation stuff so that dungeon masters get stuff made for them that they can change so there's one of those every week so this all happens every week making sure we deal with all the beginner dungeon masters who've been chasing my lost mod of fandalva videos for years giving them a class of their own um, that happens every week and right now we've got two dungeon master prep classes but there's actually supposed to be a monster combat um, tactics um, for the dungeon master and players that I will run in the future, but I'm not doing it until I have my miniatures and maps ready to go. Do you know what I mean? So that's why the Discord is, exists. It's to let people come and meet me, um, give me feedback, have a chat, uh, discover that I am not some strange un individual that uh, they just see on YouTube, um, that, that, <laughs> that I'm not an ogre. Um... <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so that, that's that's why the Discord exists, but I just don't advertise it that much. Do you know what I mean? Um, Dinomancer. If everyone got a feat, uh, I do tell my patrons about Discord uh, usually once a month, generally. Um, particularly for the ones who are coming in new who don't realise that I am there. Okay, Dinomancer, what do you got here? If everyone got a feat, um, well, it's hard, yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's the problem is that if everybody gets a feat as a player character, then what what do you give the monsters to keep up with them, or do the monsters simply become no longer a challenge? Um, do they do they wind up being just fodder? Do you know what I mean? I'm not really keen on a game that's played that way. I'm fine for um, that to kind of look like look like that when you're dealing with beginner players. But after that, there needs to be a point where it's um, 
it's a bit more scary. Like, you know, thing, things can go bad. Bad things going, um, bad ha- things happening are one of the more fun parts of the game. All right. Charles but- um, Butler, what do you got here? A character from level uh, 1 to 3, and then give them both the ASI and the feet at level 3. So, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they will be much stronger because you're doing it that way. Uh, and and Charles, if you've figured out how to make that work, then fine. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't do that myself. And um, I've tried to convince my group to not run with feats, and they, they've said, nah, we want, we want to keep them. <laughs> so, so we keep them. Anyway, I think we have kind of answered all of your questions for day, today on magic. I don't have anything super special to say other than tomorrow we, I'm going to talk about, oh, I'm going to go hashtag, hashtag, clever uses of Druidcraft. That is the topic for tomorrow. For those of you who have been waiting a very long time for it, I finally got my notes figured out. It's ready to go. Um, 5e combat is too easy as it is on uh, a balanced, yeah, yeah, and CR rating doesn't really sort of work that well anyway, after level 5. Um. <laughs> yeah, I know some people don't like the idea of any character death, uh, I'm just not one of those people, um, and I actually don't mind when my characters die, I don't really, I don't, I don't break down and cry or freak out or get upset, um, that's just sort of how I'm built, I guess. Not everybody's going to be that way. I totally get it. But then again, I approach death very differently um, to a lot of people. Um, as far as I'm concerned, death is not the end. It's just an opportunity for the dungeon master to make things more complicated. <laughs> um, Seeker, so remember, um, oh, Dragons of Stormwreck Isle drops on the 4th of October. Don't know if you're intending to cover it ETC. Well, Seeker, you know very well that um, as soon as it is in in front of my eyes and I can actually see the information, Seeker, since you are mentioning it, I will start writing some information about that particular starter box set. So you don't need to f- to concern yourself. I have not forgotten. Um, but I wanted to do the Droid Craft stuff uh i i actually at some point i'm probably going to show you some very cool miniatures that have been put out for a kickstarter as part of the lost mon of fandelva class that's coming up this week um what are we doing we're doing fandolin fandolin's coming up in a couple of days i'll do that tutorial very sh- soon uh and then um i want to talk about ravenloft running it as a, a one-shot halloween session but that doesn't mean that talking about Dragons of Stormwreck Isle is not on the cards. Uh, but I'm also going to take my time about how to do that. And also, too, I understand, what is it? Unearthed Arcana? Expert? What is it called? Expert something? What the heck is it? I can't, isn't there something that's about to drop tomorrow? There's an expert of something. Like, every every son of, son of a gun is going to be doing something with this thing very shortly, I suspect. Like, uh... Was it um is it Trent Monk and Steely uh, no and Dungeons and Dragons? What is it? What is it? One D and D expert classes. Yeah, there's a supposed to be something dropping. They don't, I mean people are already talking about it and we don't even have the document yet. So I, I've got a I'm probably going to have to go over all of that stuff. Right, that that's probably going to be a, a topic of discussion. So um. I mean, whether I do that next week or the week, I, I don't know. I, I my, my schedule is looking very, very tight now. And you already know I do six of these live streams a week and there's about five edited videos dropping every week as well. <laughs> I need to do the shorts as well because the shorts are what advertise everything else and I haven't been doing the shorts. Um, anyway, so, um, so yeah, Seeker, don't worry. I'll do Dragons of Stormwreck Isle as soon as I have it in front of my eyes. Um, big clue. Go fish or Monopoly? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, 
video game and background to your younger generation? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe respawning, possibly. Um, can I just say, big clue, I've, I've met plenty of people in their 50s, uh, that 40s and 50s, who do not like it when their character dies, and they get very upset. And they are from the older generation of playing the game. So I hate to say it, I don't think it's tied to a generation exclusively. <laughs> there are just some people who just don't like the idea of their character dying, which is fine. It's a new a new one release. Yeah, don't know. Yeah, the, yeah the, I'll, I'll, I will have to go over that stuff because I'm sure it's going to be the big thing. Everybody's going to want to talk about it. Every time I watch other people talking about it, I'm like, they didn't talk about anything that was actually... Uh, they didn't actually talk about... They didn't analyse it. They just told you what the changes were. I'm like, great. You told me what the changes were, but you didn't break it down. Um, which is what I was looking for, is like, break it down. Tell me what the issues are. Uh, I did this on my Discord. I actually I sat down with a whole bunch of people when the last one d and um, uh, playtest material was dropped. And I said tell me everything you're concerned about. And I wrote down all those questions and then I tried to have a response to those questions or concerns. And I mean, whether you agreed with me or not is beside the point, but at least I could, I was able to analyze people's concerns and then I did the live stream. Do you know what I mean? Uh, right on, do, do, do. Bard, rogues, rangers. Yes, the expert classes. Um... So each each class has the expertise um, feature in one D and D for these for the expert classes: the bard, rogue, and ranger. Okay, I, I did actually kind of know that was coming. Um, you want me to know? You do you want me to tell you what I think? Is that what you were going for? Um, I'm not against it. I actually think it makes a lot of sense hate to say it but I, I think it does uh i think it makes an awful lot of sense i feel like there might be certain skills that should be applied you you apply expertise to for a rogue ranger and bard that are different to make them feel different but i know everybody wants to have every, all you know the thing is nowadays everybody wants to have the whole cake not just part of the cake they want to do everything and they want it all now <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So um, I think ultimately what's going to wind up happening is that we'll probably wind up getting the whole cake right now. There might be some choices, but I suspect there might be wholesale, you get everything. Um, but I would like to see, you know, the range you have expertise, be able to have expertise in certain skills or rogue to have expertise in certain skills. So the bard to have expertise in certain skills. I don't think that the rogue or even the bard should have expertise in everything. Just certain things. Uh, what do you got here? The serial variant human player. You can uh, take my feet from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they don't have to worry about that now, do they? Okay, because there, is, there isn't going to be any other human but the variant human anyway. So, um, going forward in the new in the neural system. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a PC is like a Mandela. By degree, something you know you always draw a type. Do you know? Um, trying to convince a dungeon master to build a world and then destroy it, that's a hard thing for um, a dungeon master to do. Do you know what I mean? So can you imagine what it's like for a player they built their character and then they they, they they have to they have to see it go at some point? It's either gonna die, be retired or um, you know, uh, <laughs> transformed into dust, who knows? Okay, Charles, late question. Okay, you caught me before I left, so well done. You've caught me, you caught me and kept me. I'm going to turn off my phone because um, I'm, I'm hoping that I can just answer these questions with, with just the camera. Okay, so you have a suggestion on how to handle a wizard who can't track all of their spells to make a quick decision on their turn <gasps> oh shizers dude you don't have that problem do you <laughs> 
Someone picked a wizard and they don't know what to do with it. Okay, so my suggestion to you is um, if they are unsure what to do, there's a couple of things that you can get them to do. If they don't do these things, there's probably not much else you can do other than say, look, you're not equipped to play a wizard. Maybe later when you're better at running magic and you know the spells better. First thing I would do is when they write their spells on their character sheet, get them to write the page number for that spell on their character sheet. That would be top of my list, okay? That's if they have the player's handbook. That would be the first thing I would suggest. The next thing is go get them, they need to go and get themselves a pack of spell cards that actually have the description of the spells that they cast. Like, um, hang on, where is it? Can I get it? Uh, crawl back in here this thing spellbook cards arcane this is all of the wizard spells it includes some of the other um, classes as well but all of the wizard spells are in here okay this is the box you want you get them to buy this if they won't buy this or they can't afford it then what's your next next port of call if they don't have this thing which frankly I find incredibly useful uh, myself, just to remind me that I have that sodding spell. Um, if you don't, if you can't get hold of, get them to, to, to purchase them, don't buy them yourself. They can do that. Okay, if they're gonna play a wizard, they can go get that stuff. Um, the next thing I was I would suggest is pick a damage dealing cantrip that uh, they have on their spell list and if they are unsure and they're running running you know running too long say that's what you do on your turn you cast that damage dealing cantrip i'm going to give you a time limit and then that's it because ultimately as a wizard if you're playing a wizard or even a spell caster of any kind you should be pre-planning things now things will change Ultimately, things will change when you're casting spells. Yeah, somebody might do something and a plan that you had in place or as, um, an idea you had in mind is gone. But there's actually a two-step approach to casting spells in Dungeons and Dragons. First off, there's plan one. This is the primary plan that you worked on before your turn. Okay, but there's this other plan. This is plan B. If everything goes wrong and there's nothing else that I can think of to do, this is plan B. Plan B for me usually looks like this when I'm playing a wizard. I will either cast a damage dealing cantrip or take the dodge action. Does that make sense? That, that is my plan B. If my plan A suddenly gets messed up because somebody did something that I, I wasn't expecting. And so what you need to do is you need to train that player who's playing that wizard into having plan A and plan B. So have a discussion about what their plan B will be. Plan B will always be the same. It's always been the same for me. I take the dodge action, I cast a damage dealing cantrip, that's it. Plan A looks different, and that will be de dependent on what happens. And if you're not ready to go, then we go to plan B. Um, but yes, if... if <laughs> I think that's really the only advice that I have for you with regard to playing uh, players who are playing a wizard and they just can't keep track of all their spells and they aren't good at making quick decisions because you really do need to know what you're doing if you're playing a wizard. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a reason why that was the first character build I did. Thank you, Charles, for the super chat. Thank you for the $2 shoot super chat. Um, if... <laughs> Just because I've suggested that doesn't mean it's going to work. You might very well find that your player gets really upset that you say you need to have a plan A and a plan B. Let's establish what your plan B is if your plan A won't work. Okay? Um, they might get they might get angry. They might get mad. Heck, they might even leave your table. Um, but you, you've got to have the discussion, right? <laughs> something's got to something's got to give. You don't actually. I mean. People don't have to play a wizard. They could always play something else that's a bit a bit different, you know? Like, you still play a caster that isn't, like, downright um, complicated to sort of figure out. You know, sorcerers, uh, frankly, I don't think they're that easy to play, but um, a warlock is like a blaster, basically. There's not a lot of choices to make. You're not going to get that many spells. 
Um, it's, I think it's significantly easier to play than a, a wizard, in my opinion. Uh, even a cleric is significantly easier to play than compared to a wizard. All right, Dynomancer. Yeah, letting them know. But see here, you what you do with your initiative is you... What I would suggest to you is you have your initiative visible to everybody. So if you're playing in person, you just put their initiative on little tags along your Dungeon Master screen, if you've got a Dungeon Master screen. If you don't have a Dungeon Master screen, you have somebody who keeps track of initiative on a board, and they can and, and they can show, and, and, and they do all that work for you. Because you've got enough to deal with, Charles. Like, you're the Dungeon Master, you're working hard enough, okay? Um, that would be my suggestion. Okay, what do you got here, Big Clue? Uh, Crawford said they're um, grouping the... 12 player classes into four groups expert marshals arcane and uh, arcane spellcasters and divine uh car spellcasters healers okay yep uh, to reflect the original four types of party members which makes a lot of sense um i don't think that that's actually something that's revolutionary um i don't have an issue with them doing that at all uh massive head injury and bad memory Oh, okay. So I work in the health sector, Charles, uh, with people with um, uh, brain trauma, um, mental illness, and drug addiction problems. And so, yes, it's probably the worst class for them to be playing as a wizard, even if they love the idea of playing a wizard. You may even want to consider seeing if they are open to the idea of playing an arcane caster who is a sidekick, where there are less choices. Do you know what I mean? That might actually be easier for them to deal with. Because what you're probably dealing with here is not just poor memory. Okay, when you're dealing with somebody like that, it's not just about memory. It's that they may have lost some of some my my area of expertise is psychology, philosophy, and mathematics. That I want that's what I did my degree in. Okay. Uh, so one of your might find is their ability to process things quickly. This is one of the things I find at work. Some people struggle to process information quickly and they actually need quite a lot of time to process. And so even if they start processing before everybody else, it still might not be long enough to make that final decision. Um, yeah. But yeah, look, if that helps you in some way, great. This is the first drop, is it? Um... No, I believe... I, I, are we talking about Unearthed Arcana? Um, uh, if it is the mental issue... Um, Colour-coded cards. Colour-coded cards? Yeah, colour-coded cards, maybe. Combat spells are red. Non-combat are blue. Yep. Yeah, try that and see how that works. Dynamancer's... Um, it's a, I mean, it may or may not work. It depends. Uh, you can only try and see how see how it turns out. Do you know what I mean? I've tried running Dungeons and Dragons for people at work myself, and it's not that easy. It's actually extremely difficult. Uh, but then again, the people I'm working with are probably not like your player. They're like the sections they they're behind locked doors you know they're locked gates and padlocks everywhere so it's a very different scenario okay i think we have done enough we've covered everything till the till the cows go home um and of course we'll be i'll be talking about the uh droidcraft spell tomorrow because that's the plan so let me get us um out of here how's it going harry <laughs> Um, I just want to thank my patrons for supporting me to make sure I can keep doing this class and the other classes that I run on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's been watching my live streams and uh, the replays of my live streams and my edited videos. I really do appreciate it. It makes a big difference, particularly if you're not running an ad blocker. Um, uh, I just want to say wherever you are in the world, okay, whether it be the, the early morning um, the night, the afternoon, okay, look after yourself, your family and your friends, be nice to your neighbours and hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.